Uh, our next speaker is Adil Balkiwala. He resides in Seattle, Washington. He has developed technique of how body and integrating it with mind, your emotion, your vital, and of course your psychic. So he is he has termed it to Purna Yoga. And that's what Sirbindo's yoga is all about. The Purna Yoga means we are integrating all aspects of life in our approach to life at mental level, physical level, vital level, and spiritual level. So he will be talking about body consciousness, which most of us do not pay attention to. It's very ironic that human being, which house, body house, a psychic being, a soul, divine element in us, so it's like a temple, and we don't keep up with it. It's very ironic. Second is that the temple we have taken so casually, we don't even know that we have a body. Ask yourself, when did you start last remember that you have a body from morning to evening? We are living in mind in your emotion, but not in a body. When we have pain, when we are hungry, we have some kind of signals, and then we know there is a body. This is how robotic we have become as a human being. So it's very imperative that we now start focusing on body as a living entity, which actually house something eternal within us. When that eternal goes away, body has no value. So how important it is to even keep up with the body. So that's why we are here to learn about how do we become very conscious of our body, how important it is. But then how do we use it as a means, as a tool to realize our ultimate truth and be part of the new creation you see, Arvindo has defined, explained in Life Divine, his whole chapter, he says Gnostic being, and it has supramental body. He's even describing it, what he sees in his prophetic vision. It's a mind-boggling explanation of body that is emerging out of us. And I suggest that you should read it. So that is the power of body. And with further ado, I would like Adil Bhai to come and speak. The spine erect. <coughs> Bring your hands to Namaste. And join me for the Gayatri. We will start with Vishwamitra's Gayatri and then with Sri Aurobindo's Gatri. Yeah. 
is that things don't happen, you have to make them happen, you have to participate. You cannot be a bystander and expect this divine transformation to happen. We have to be a willing and conscious and totally focused participant. Right? Yes. yes. Before we get serious, I'm going to tell you a story. Story. It was brought up in India and life is stories, everything is stories. But this one is a true one, a true story. This happened, uh, say about 15 years ago. We get the names right, Harish, Harish. Harish Kapadia is a Gujarati mountain climber. He is one of the most accomplished mountain climbers in America. And he's a student of my mother and my brother in India after I left, they took over. And so he studies yoga with uh, my mother and my brother. And uh, this is in Bombay, as I said, about 15 years ago. It was a Saturday evening. And our center, our home, is considered a Sri Aurobindo center in the city of Bombay by the mother. And so she gave us a time to meditate. It was 7 p.m. So every Saturday since 1969, up to today, there is a meditation in our home. And sometimes you know, there are five people and sometimes there are 50 people. You just never know how many people show up. If it's an occasion, some big event, then lots of people come. And this was an event. I can't remember what event it was. It was some big day. And it was in the summer. And Harish Kapadia came. Now our meditation room at that time uh, was a room set aside in the house which could accommodate about 25 people sitting comfortably. And a few more on a big sofa in the back. That day, it was a big day, so there were 60, 70 people in there, they could not all fit into the room. So by the time Harish Kapadia came in, uh, there was no room to go inside. So he brought a friend, some uh, foreigner friend with him. So they both sat outside and meditated. So they never got to go inside the room. And after meditation, we usually have some snacks and people gently talk and we share stories. And they were in a rush, this Harish Kapadia and this Englishman, who turned out to be an Englishman. 
and they said we have to go away. Sorry, we can't even go and do pranam. But uh, this gentleman, his name is so and so. He's a very famous mountain climber, and is on his way to Everest to climb Everest. And so my mother said, "Oh, you're going to climb Everest. Let me give you something as a blessing." So she ran into her bedroom, pulled out one of the mother's blessing packets. It was a, if you've not seen a blessing packet, it is tiny, and the photos on it are microscopic. And there was a tiny, tiny picture of Vada and Sirabhananda Samadhi, sort of the one with the big couches, yeah. but it's so tiny you cannot see them at all. And she said, would you like this? And you may not know this, but mountaineers are very, very superstitious. They believe in the elements, they believe in nature, they believe in the gods, because they are out there facing death every second. And so he said, yes, yes, I'll certainly take it. And so my mother said, it will protect you. <laughs> I said, okay. He put it in his pocket and they ran out. Now oh God. Fast forward. Four months later. Maybe it was five months later. The phone rings. Harish says, I would like to come for meditation. My friend has come back from the Himalayas. Okay. Saturday they came in. And when we saw him, we were stunned because he was in bandages. He had all his toes amputated. It had frostbite. And he could barely walk and he was in a really bad state. <coughs> And they came too late for the meditation. So by that time we were sitting and talking. So he started to tell us what happened. He said they got up there and the altitude was fine, the winds were fine, everything was fine. And they were climbing up the whole group and suddenly a storm hit. And when the storm hit, his whole troop got scattered everywhere. And they were trying to find shelter and they could not find shelter. And he was seeing them dying one at a time. He said, within two days, they were all dead. He was the only one alive. And he said, he could see the summit. And he said, this is my life mission. So I'm going to go for it. And so he went for it. And he went without oxygen. You're talking at the altitude of a 747, right? We're talking about 30,000 feet here. <coughs> And he went and he went on top and he made it. And when he finally got to the top, he said, But I have nothing. I don't even have a flag to put here. What will I plant on the summit to prove that I was there? And he came back. Oh, that blessing packet, that, that packet that that woman had given me in Bombay. So he pulled it out of his pocket and he planted the blessing packet right on Mount Everest. <laughs> And then he started to feel extremely weak, and as he started to come down the mountain, he fell. And once you fall, that's it. But he was a, a few, uh, I think, thousand feet down, and he felt this nudge. He said, What's going on? Because he couldn't move. And he felt this person lifting him. So he got up and he saw a man. So, oh, this is interesting. And the man half carried him down all the way to base camp. And uh, so he turned around to thank him, finally, and he was gone. And so he says, that's my story. And so we were all very happy with the story that somebody came and saved him. And so we had dinner. Now back to Bombay, right? We had dinner. And then after dinner, he wanted to wash his hands. So my mother said, why don't you use that room there to wash your hands? So he went into that room, which was the meditation room. Washed his hands and as he came out, we could hear him shouting, Oh my God! Oh my God! So we all went, what's the matter? What's the matter? He said, that's the guy who came and helped me. It was Sri Aurobindo. Mm. <laughs> wow. 
You've never seen the photo before. That's the man who carried me down from the mountain. So now let's do a test. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. With me, it's always participation, so you're not going to be sitting around and just listening. <laughs> so do this with your hand, your, uh, your uh, dominant hand, whichever is your hand. Now let's see if this works in a Aurobindonian context. Uh, point to a light bulb. Point to a door. Everyone, everyone participate, everyone, every single person. Point to a door with your right hand, come in. Point to uh, an exit sign. Good. Okay, point to somebody else. Okay, now point to yourself. Don't move. Don't move. Look around the room. Just look around the room. Okay, put your hands down. So now, you need to understand something. You have spent your whole life living in somebody else's house. You have spent your whole life living in, excuse me, hotels. <laughs> and you wonder why you are lonely. You wonder why you don't feel at home. If you spend your life out here, and that is not where you live, how can you be happy? If you spend, God forbid, your life out here, and this is not where you live, how can you be happy? You just told me that this is where you live. This is me. Everybody, point to here. Somewhere up, somewhere down. But they were just in this area. I speak in front of mega corporations, thousands of people in a three-piece suit, not in this, in a three-piece suit. And uh, I ask corporate executives to do the same thing. They all do that. They all do here. And then they say, why are we pointing here? It's because there is an inbuilt knowledge that this is our home. We know this. We teach this in kindergarten. We teach Purna Yoga and we ask these kids, point to yourself and they point here. The only place is in Japan, they point here because they are taught to do that. Because they have been taught to do something that is not instinctual. But otherwise, everywhere else, people point here. Just as all of you did. What does this mean? This means that you, in your essence, know that this is where you live. This is who you are. And you choose to live in your mind and then wonder why you have a conflict in your life. Some people choose to live in their pelvis and then they have real conflict. <laughs> It's called the name of yoga all over the world, people who live in that pelvis. So, the work of the master and the mother is the awakening of something that is our true nature, which we have suppressed for millennia. And that is the anatta, the heart center. The heart center has to be awoken for us to evolve to the next thing, the next level, the next stage, the next state in our evolution. Without the heart center, the mind's evolution is causing enormous problems in our world. I mean, all the problems you can think of, whether it's the fact that there's more plastic in the ocean than fish <laughs> today. So it's just utterly obnoxious what we have done to our Earth, Mother Earth. And why have we done that? Because we've lived from our heads and we've not lived from our hearts. 
So all the guidance that Savitris have seen is go to the heart, live from the heart, live from the heart, live with integrity. So it behooves us to really look at our lives and see whether we've led them from the passions of the pelvis, from the thoughts of the mind, which is the sensual gratifications made into a thought form, or whether we truly are living from our hridai, our heart. The work will not happen if you live from the mind. You can understand every time. I'll tell you another story. With me, it's story time. So here we go. And again, it's true. This is from my father's brother. Some of you may know him, Nadi Balkiwala. He was one of the greatest geniuses India has ever produced. Uh, Indira Gandhi called him one of the three greatest minds alive. You could ask him any question about anything and he could give you an answer with quotes from the Encyclopedia Britannica with the page number. <coughs> Mine was totally stunning, totally stunning. I would give him a book to read because nearing the last part of his life uh, I really wanted him to get healthier. And so I'd give him books on whole, wholesome healing and natural healing, and he'd hold the book and he'd go, ta 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 just like that. Thank you so much. That was a very interesting read. I used to call him Nani Kaka because Kaka means father's brother. So I said, Nani Kaka, did you get it? He said, yeah, especially that particular incident on page 43, where he talks about the way in which that test was done it was amazing. And then on page 440, you just went through this book a second ago. And you know everything in that book. It was so brilliant. He had a desk with phones and he could pick up and call the President of the United States straight to the line. Indian President, the Prime Minister, I mean just anybody at a moment's notice. Okay? Got the context? Yes or no? Yes. Good. Now, he comes to the late phase of his life. He has a few strokes. He's in a wheelchair. He's 81 at that time. And we go to meet him, Savitri and myself. We both go and meet him and sit and talk to him. And we talk to him about the fact that it's time now not to fight so much. Because he was the head of Tata's, right? Tata Sons. And then uh, when he got his strokes, he still fought. He still wanted to go and go back to his office and work harder. And the doctor said, you know, if you just relax and just take it easy, you'll recover. He refused. He did not understand it. He continued to work. And got another stroke, and got another stroke, and got another stroke. So finally, when he couldn't move anymore, we were sitting with him and talking with him. And we said, uh, Savitri started to talk with him and said, it's time now for you to go inside and feel the spirit and uh, go into your heart and feel the love and feel the light. And that's the essence of creation, love and light. And he listened and could see tears coming out of his eyes because he couldn't speak anymore. India's greatest orator couldn't speak anymore. Ironic, isn't it? And uh, finally, we couldn't do anything else, so we left. And then my father went to meet him, his brother. And he said, I hope you heard, Nami, that it's time for you to go inside. And then my uncle said four words which I'll never forget. He said, I, barely speaking like, uh, like that, I don't know how. Wow. I don't know how. <coughs> this 
this was truly monumental because his mind was cultivated to such an extent that he knew everything but he had not learned how to go inside himself. So today I'm going to start off with some basic techniques for you to learn how to go inside yourself because without that you, God forbid, will be in the same position. When it really counts, you won't know what to do. Are you with me? Yes. yes. <laughs> so if you cannot see this board, please move yourself or uh, come to the front and do whatever you need to. I tell that to my daughter all the time. Your education is your choice. You have to do whatever it is. It's the same with all of you. you can't see it more. Now, I'm not a great scholar of Sri Aurobindo. I've only been studying him since 1969. But uh, I try to use his stuff and apply it in my day to day life. So all the stuff that we have come up with, Savitri and I, has been through the work of Sri Aurobindo and the mother as applied to our lives. So what we have here is spirit. Spirit talks to us through feeling. Spirit talks through us, to us through feelings. The primary feeling of the spirit talk is love. Spirit communicates with images, and the primary image is light. Right? So in the spirit end, like the photograph, you see light and you get the feeling of love. So these two are the essence of spirit trying to manifest in matter, like love. Now, when uh, we do not feel the feelings because we are too busy doing more important things, like trying to figure out what the Kardashians are doing and what uh, is on the news and all that stuff is just so important. When we are doing that and not paying attention to our feelings, then we start to get disturbances in our emotions. To interpret and to understand this, we are cultivated a faculty which is, as Shraddhalu said, not known to any other creature, which is the thinking process. So thoughts do not come first. Sorry, Napoleon Hill. Thoughts do not come first. Feelings come first. It's when we do not attune ourselves with our feelings that we have to analyze stuff. Thoughts come afterwards. And the thoughts, when ignored, create a reminder that you're ignoring your thoughts, which means that you're ignoring your emotions, which means that you're ignoring your feelings, which means you're ignoring the spirit. And that is now in your body. So when, by the time something is in your body, you feel stiff, you feel achy, you have an ache or pain, you have high blood pressure, you have low blood pressure, you have some problem, it's because you've ignored all the thoughts, it's because you've ignored the feelings that create rights, you don't see more the feelings, blah, 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 blah. all backing down, backing up to the spirit.
So to take care of our body, we have to address the body at the body's level. Yes, you have to do asana. You have to do pranayama. You just have to. There's just no option. If you want to do yoga, yoga, you have to do asana. I'll explain in a moment why. But it means that you do need to pay attention to this thought. The body of manas. And emotions and feelings. We, especially in India, we tend to suppress them a lot. You don't actually look at them and say, huh, this is a feeling. It's something that's coming up. What do I do with it? No, no, no. Hide your feelings, put them underneath the carpet. You cannot hide your feelings, tell your story. <laughs> Let's call him George. His name is not George. We keep his identity secret. We were in Hawaii. We have a Purna Yoga Center in Kialakekua, which is just south of uh, Kona. We have another one in Hilo on the east side also. But this one, we were there, and we were at the Hongwanji Mission, which is a very large room. And I was doing a teacher training, and I was training the teachers how to treat people therapeutically. Therapy, problems. And so the teachers were in a large circle, and then one by one the student would come with a problem. And so George came in. And I said, okay, George, what is your problem? And he, he was buff. Strong muscles everywhere, and wearing a very expensive looking yoga outfit. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, I look at his body and so everything's all impossible. What's the problem? He said, it's my knees. I said, what's the problem, George? He said, uh, it's very weak. It just collapsed on me. So he looked at his thigh and said, my God, that guy can do 100 squats. Really strong. So I said, how did it happen, George? Have you had it? Analyzed and we had the doctors look at it. He said, Oh, yeah, I've had all the MRIs, the x rays, there's nothing wrong. They can't find anything wrong. So I said, Then how do you know there is something wrong? He says, They just collapse. Sometimes they just end up on the floor. I said, How did it start? He said, I don't know. It was a few years ago. I got out of bed, I stood up, and then collapsed. And then it keeps happening all the time. I had some experience with the body. And so I said to George, I said, George, what financial loss did you have just before this happened? He said, what? I said, what financial loss did you have just because it happened? He said, I heard. I just couldn't figure out what you're talking about. I said, uh, why don't you think about it? In the meantime, I take the next student. So he started to walk out of the circle. Within a moment, he turned around and came, I don't know, I remember, I remember. I said, what is it, George? Believe it or not, this is what he said. I remember just a few weeks before that, I lost $300 million in the savings and loans collapse in Arizona. Hmm. Said, and you forgot that. <laughs> <laughs> Hundred million dollars. So I said to him, okay, then let's do this. Let's go back to these issues and work on them. And so we worked on them. Never had any problem since. So if you think that your feelings are not tied to your body, you're not in reality. Every single thought you have affects your body. Every single feeling you have affects your body. And it starts to create what uh, Shridhalu called knots, which in yoga we call granti. They are knots with a K, K-N-O-T-S. Knots in the body. And it starts to make the body impure. And the mother said, we must keep the temple clean if you want to install in it the living presence. 
You must keep the temple clean if you wish to install in it the living presence. So think about the thoughts that you are thinking, which you think are not going to affect you. And know that you're wrong. They are affecting you. 100%. No question about it. <coughs> they are affecting you. Actually, this talk is on the uh, importance of light in the body. I'm giving a part two talk. Don't miss that one. Uh, that's on the heart. And I'll tell you about the anatomy of the heart and how it works in Sri Aurobindo's context. Now, something that most people don't realize is that Sri Aurobindo was one of the greatest, if not the greatest, master of our age. Hmm? We're not talking about miracles like helping a man come down from a mountain <coughs> 40 years after he has left his body. But I'm talking about the constancy of his energy in every part of matter universally. Now, the reason, one of the reasons he chose to leave his body is because he needed to take the next step. And he couldn't do it in his form. So when he left his body and he became this mighty energy that is everywhere, he then continued his evolutionary process. You cannot imagine somebody like Sri Aurobindo saying, okay, I left my body, I'm going to sleep now. No. It's a constant evolution. And so the Aurobindonian energy is constantly evolving. And know that what he wrote then is extremely powerful, but what he's doing now is even more powerful. But how do you know what he's doing now? That's what I'm going to talk about in a moment. <coughs> so we have thoughts, which is the mind. We have the emotions or the feelings, which is the vital. Not the feelings, feelings is heart. And then we have the body. So the mind, the vital, the heart, and the body. So the heart is closest to the spirit. The heart is closest to the spirit. I'm going to not talk about it today purposely because I'm going to leave it for the next talk tomorrow. Does everyone really get the power of the mind on the body? Do you get that? How much time do I have? Do you get this? Yes. You're not, you're not enthusiastically. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it must be lunch. Tomorrow we should not have lunch. So the brain is getting more awake. <laughs> Hmm. Okay, I'll tell you another quick story. I have a student by the name of Phyllis Pilgrim. She's the head of Rancho La Puerta, a yoga program. And she was, I don't know what she's doing now. And uh, she, Rancho La Puerta is the world's largest spa. It's just south of the border in Mexico. And she had back pain. And so I worked with her in back pain, it would cause her relief, and then it would again come back, and it would cause her relief, and she again come back. No matter what we did, it caused her relief, and it again came back. And uh, the years passed, and I stopped going to Rancho La Puerta, because I started to focus on Purna Yoga exclusively. <coughs> and then I was in San Diego, teaching at a uh, yoga journal conference, and Phyllis Pilgrim walks into the room. And she comes up to me and says, oh, hi, Phyllis, you hug and all that. And then she says, uh, my back pain is gone. I said, oh, wonderful, what happened? What did you do? It wasn't anything I did. Except that I wrote a book. <laughs> and I'd like you to read it. And then you'll understand why my back pain went. 
and the book, it's a bestseller book, it's called The Hidden Passport. The Hidden Passport. And it's a fascinating story of her in a concentration camp as a child in the Philippines where uh, everything was stripped from them, everything from their physical possessions to their very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Dignity, to their very dignity, everything is stripped from them. And as a little child, her mother asked her to keep in the only safe place they knew, her passport. In her panty in the back. Mm. Just right here. Passport. Mm. And so she would hide the passport in her panty during all the searches. And they were searched twice a day. This is inhuman. She said for those four or five years, however long she was in the concentration camps, her constant fear was, nobody should find my hidden passport. And she said as soon as she started to write her story in a book, she realized that that was the cause of her pain. Only mm -hmm. nobody must find the hidden passport. She had forgotten all about that until she started to write the book. And she's now about 75 years old. She wrote the book about five years ago. So something that happened to her as a little toddler for five years old affected her whole life until she discovered what the feelings and emotions were behind that injury and it was gone. She said, the moment I finished the book, my pain was gone, hasn't come back. Okay? Mm -hmm. So we have done mind, we have done the importance of body, and we have done this set. Now, by profession, I am a teacher. And if you don't get it, it's my fault. <laughs> so we always have examinations. <laughs> So, without saying a word, everyone please stand. Make eye contact with one other person in the room and get close enough that you can talk with them without speaking loudly, but don't say anything. Don't say anything. Okay, now one of the two of you raise your hand. Thank you, put your hand down. The person who raised the hand will be the speaker. The other person will be the listener. Okay, does anyone not have a helper? Will you raise your hand? Two people with raised hands go together. Right behind you, sir. My, my friend. Anybody else does not have a helper? Okay. Now the person who raised the hand will summarize everything I have covered <laughs> in two minutes. Unless you can say it, you are not paying attention and you don't know it and you wasted your time and money. So let's go for it. Two minutes to summarize everything I covered. Begin now.
นะครับจบไป Now it's the other person's turn. <laughs> Now the other person was listening, right? When you were listening, you were thinking, "Oh, he forgot that. He forgot that. She forgot that. She forgot that." What I forgot. So you will do the same thing, but you will not repeat anything the first person said. You will only fill in the blanks. What the first person forgot. Please begin two minutes now. I'm just waiting for silence. What you cannot repeat, you do not remember. What you do not remember, you cannot use. So to make anything usable, you have to be able to repeat it. So my brother and I used to take classes with Guruji in the KSI. After class, we just go through the whole class with each other. Repeat it. That's how you know it. <coughs> Ever since consciousness was born on earth. Ever since consciousness was born on earth. Life is the same in insect, ape, and man. It's stuff unchanged. It's way the common root. If new designs of richer details grow, if new designs of richer details grow, and thought is added, and more tangled care. If little by little it wears a brighter face, still, even in man, the plot is mean and poor. Sri Aurobindo, in Savitri. Even in man, the plot is mean <coughs> and poor. It's a long message, but we don't have that much time. So now, I want you to understand that it is going to be a tapasya. It's going to be a work to make this happen, the evolution of consciousness.
and you have to learn who you are, what your mission is, what your karma is, and how to take it into the Sanatana Dharma. Supposing you walked up to some stranger on the street and you said, Hey, hello, I want to have a relationship with you. It would be uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. Just slap you on the face. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Especially and Indian girls. <laughs> I was not talking about a uh, different gender, I'm talking about just anybody. Yeah? <laughs> I'm not talking about a sexual relationship, it's just a relationship. But why? Why is it so different from what we do in the yoga? We spend 30, 40 years completely ignoring ourselves and then suddenly come to us, who is a stranger to us, and say, I want a relationship with you, now come on. <laughs> it's not different. It takes time to build this relationship because you have not had the communication with it. It's the same with your body. You can't sit there and just do chakras and suddenly like that. It takes time to build, to trust. So very often I'm on a plane and somebody sitting next to me says, uh, what do you do? I said, you know, I tried yoga once. <laughs> it's a completely meaningless statement. <laughs> if you practice it with a really good teacher who knows their job every day for about nine years, then you know whether you've tried it or not. He said, I tried calculus once, it didn't work. <laughs> So I want you to introduce, I want to introduce you to Savitri. I don't get the facts wrong. Savitri was about 25 years old when she started to meditate. She started to meditate because she had a life which was quite inexplicable. As a child at the age of 12, she was hit on the head with a baseball bat in full swing. Mm -hmm. While playing baseball. That's why I don't like the game. But uh, she was in a coma for a week. Left her body. Then uh, at the age of 17, her parents died in an air crash. Emperor Ashoka in Bombay. <coughs> Then a few years later, her sister, her only living relative, was murdered. And then she started to have all these, I mean, remember, mind-body connections. Uh, she had many, many heart attacks and strokes and uh, brain tumors and all that. She clinically died three times. Went to the other worlds brought back information, was told by the masters, no, you can't leave. She said, I want to leave. I said, no, you can't leave, you have to go back. And so she stayed. But she was a complete atheist. She could not believe that God could cause these things to happen to her, to anybody. She refused to read spiritual books, even though her father was very much into spirituality in India. And uh, I married her. She has been the most beautiful woman in the world, of course, in my eyes. And so sweet and caring. So I married her. I was, I think, uh, 18 when I met her. I married her in 1981. So we've been married a while. And I saw her go through all these incredible traumas. And every time she'd come out from a trauma, she'd come out with new information, with more uh, connection. And she was being guided to meditate and being taught these techniques by someone whom she called the Lord. 
the Lord. And since she didn't believe in God, she said, this Lord person is guiding me. And our honeymoon was in Pondicherry. And uh, one of our, we married, I married her four times. <laughs> because I'm a Zoroastrian, I'm a Parsi. So we did the Parsi wedding. Uh, her father was a Muslim, her mother was a Roman Catholic. So we did a ceremony in their tradition. And then we did an exchange of garlands in Sri Aurobindo's room, which was our symbolic <coughs> wedding, our spiritual wedding. Those of you know the mother's granddaughter, Purna Prema, we used to stay with her always. And she lived just across the street from the ashram. And so she actually hand made the garlands for us. And we exchanged them in Sri Aurobindo's room in a quiet private ceremony. And a couple of years passed after that. We kept going back to Pondi every year. And one day Kumud, who is no longer alive, Kumud then said, you want to go up to Sri Aurobindo's room as we normally did? I said, yes. So we went up there and uh, she said, to Savitri, you go in there alone. So Savitri went in alone and we left her for about half an hour to 45 minutes. And then we went back to get her and we looked at her and she was like glowing as she came out of the room. Then she told me later that when I was in the room, the master appeared, Sri Aurobindo appeared in a cold, solid light and then revealed himself to me. I was the one guiding you, the Lord. And ever since then, he has been her guide. I can't tell you all the details because it's her prerogative to do that. But uh, he taught her methods, which he said he did not do in his lifetime. <coughs> because despite Sri Aurobindo's astonishing unimaginable genius and mastery and spiritual power. <coughs> there was not a one, two, three step technique. He left it to the individual to find out their own way. And he told her that I'm clarifying. This is the way. Why? Sri Aurobindo assembled. Now again, this is again the genius of Sri Aurobindo. And that is why he is the avatar of the new age, the future. He said he looked at all the masters of the past. And see, they made the Buddha does meditation for so many decades. Jesus spent so many years in his contemplation. Uh, Krishna is born as an avatar. What are the qualities that happen to these people in that state? And he noticed that there were three things that happened. Number one, they went away from their scattered mind into their sushumna, into their light. They cultivated an aureole, a cocoon around their head and then around their whole body. So that shakti came to them after that tapasya. And Sri Aurobindo said to her, to Savitri, I am going to teach you how to do it right away. Instead of waiting 40 years and Serena came and meditating, you can do it in two years, one year, depending on your sincerity. Number one quality, sincerity. And so he taught her these techniques. And I want you to realize that there are blessings waiting to come down upon us. If only we will open up to them. We are closing ourselves off from our own emancipation. No one else is to blame. No one. In Samithi, the master writes, Awake, 
in a dead rotating universe. We whirl not here upon a casual globe abandoned to a task beyond our force. Even through the tangled anarchy called fate and through the bitterness of death and fall, an outstretched hand is felt upon our lives. Even through the tangled anarchy called fate and through the bitterness of death and fall, an outstretched hand is felt upon our lives. It is near us in unnumbered bodies and births. It is near us in unnumbered bodies and births. In its unshaken grasp, it keeps for us safe the one inevitable supreme result no will can take away and no doom change. The crown of conscious immortality, the Godhead promised to our struggling souls when first man's heart dared death and suffered life. It is waiting, it is waiting, it is holding this promise for us, it's holding it. And we are saying, no, no, I've got much more important things to do. God had promised to our struggling souls First, man's heart dared death and suffered life. And if we won't do it, who will? <coughs> we have this modicum. We have this modicum of awareness. If we won't actually do this work, just think about who's going to do it. People keep saying that. Uh, the, well, I, I heard the sentence. Uh, the new creation is coming. It's not coming. If we don't do it, it's not coming. <laughs> it's like sitting in a train which is not moving and saying, okay, Pune station is coming. It's not coming. You have to go to it. It's promised, it's waiting, but you have to go to it. We have to go to it, not you. We have to go to it. And therein lie the twelve petals of the mother's symbol. And now the techniques, which I'll show you one off right away. This is a quotation from the mother. She writes, concentrate in the heart, concentrate in the heart, enter into it, go within and deep and far, as far as you can. Concentrate in the heart, enter into it. Go within and deep and far, as far as you can. A light is glowing there in the deep quietude of the heart. It is the divinity in you, your true being. Hear its voice. Follow its dictate. So, we have the first technique of going into the heart. Are you all ready? Yes. 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 Sit up erect, please. And make that a habit, so you don't have to move when I say that. <laughs> the hand. 
Ah, actually, this is a good segue to what uh, Shraddhan was talking about. The hand, the kra, the action, modality. The hand and the fingertips especially have more nerve endings than any other part of your body except for your eyes. So we are going to use that faculty and use the middle finger which represents the heart and put it at the heart center. Now where is the heart center? Assuming you're sitting up erect, it's at the level of the front of your armpits. Front of your armpits. And now, shut your eyes and gently press that little finger into your sternum and umbrium joint and gently press and imagine the finger going deep inside all the way to the center of your body in front of your spine where in your subtle body you have the connection with your sushumna <coughs> This is the thread of light which Sri Aurobindo wants us to make a pillar of light. This is the place to which you pointed earlier when you said, this is me. This is the place where you feel love. This is the place where you feel love. So feel that love inside you and imagine a soft white light glowing there. If you can't see it, imagine it. And slowly inhale as you release your hand. First little thing, the practical. Mm. What to do? You go to 3.30, correct? Right? Correct. Right. So I have a list of things. Things to do to help you get more into your body. Number one is a statement that I heard from a man called Ed Foreman. And he said to me, he said, when you are inside the body, you can't read the label. When you're inside the bottle, you can't read the label. That means you need somebody to look at you. You need a mentor. You need a guide. It's imperative that you find somebody whom you trust, who can teach you. It's very, very useful. In fact, uh, after, after the session is over, you can go to the back of the room. We have lots of stuff available for you to look at. So there are three questions that we must ask ourselves every day. I do it when I start my practice every day in the morning. Everyone ready? Mm -hmm. If you think you have a Macaulayan memory and you can remember all this, fine. Otherwise, please write it down. Mm -hmm. Number one. Who am I? Number two. Why am I here? Number three, where am I going? These three questions must be asked every day. Every day. Who am I? Now see, what was your mind doing? <coughs> what is your mind doing just now? Trying to answer. Exactly, it's trying to answer the question. Don't answer the question. <laughs> You're defeated. As soon as you answer it, you're defeated. You think you got the answer, it's finished. Mm -hmm. Now I don't have to ask it again. No. Mm -hmm. Don't answer the question. 
Just ask the question. Life provides the answers. Don't let your mind answer it. Who am I? Why am I here? Karma. Why am I here? Where am I going? Karma. Am I working? Where am I going? Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? Every day. Every day. Whether you are an asana teacher, whether you are a businessman, whether you are a politician, doesn't matter whether you are a school teacher. Ask these three questions every single day. Doesn't matter what your profession is. Ask these three questions. That's a to-do. So number one, find a teacher. Number two, ask these three questions. Number three, <coughs> excuse me, get rid of distractions. Get rid of distractions. Distractions take your energy and suck it out of your life. And mine, yours and mine, both. Mm -hmm. Television, a huge distraction. Newspapers, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. All that stuff is just taking you away from it. What are you going to do when you're dying? I wish I'd read more things on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you have read my book, Fire of Love? My first book? So many of you. If you haven't read it, get it on I think Amazon. Right? Yeah. Get it. Uh, it's a very important book for yoga, for practical yoga. How to live yoga in fact. It's not about asana. It's called Fire of Love. We don't have them for sale. So again, reduce distractions. Reduce distractions. My father used to tell me if it's not helping you grow. It's helping you move backwards. Then, next, respect for the body is love for the body. Respect for the body is love for the body. Right? Asmukhai just said, what did he say? The body is the temple. Your soul is the living presence in it. Would you treat a temple with disrespect? Would you keep the te temple dirty? Would you make it all crooked? Or would you align it according to Vastu? Would you make it perfect in all ways? Because you're going to put the deity in there, the presence in there. I have the relics of the mother in my home, and I treat them with so much respect. Everything around it has to be perfect. See, our home was like a, a sanctuary for people, for Ashramites as they were leaving uh, to go around the world because Chennai was very small in those days. So they had to come to Bombay. And so Udar and MP Bandit and they all used to come to our home. And so we learned all our stories through them. And Udarji told us a story once. He said he went to a place where Sri Aurobindo's relics were installed. And he had gone and installed them himself a few years ago. Then he went back. Does everyone know what I mean by relics? Is that a yes? Yes. yes. You know, it's either the nails or the hair. Because whenever a saint or a great master uh, has their nails cut, they are all preserved because they contain his energy or her energy. So they are very, very precious and they are to be treated with great respect and there is a certain way in which they are to be stored in first in silver, then in gold, and wood, etc. And so uh, he said he had installed them and so he went back and he said he was entering the place where the installation was, expecting to feel the energy and there was no energy. Sri Aurobindo's energy wasn't there. So he went closer and closer. He said, what's going on? Have the relics been removed? He said, no, no, they're there, they're there at the end. He said, something is wrong. So he went, can't feel the energy. Then he went and sat right next to it. Ooh, he fell with the Shakti of Sri Aurobindo. Then he left and walked back and was gone. So 
I said, what's going on? Something is going wrong with this organization here. And he found out that there were quarrels happening between the people who were running that particular sector. And when there are quarrels happening, the Shakti withdraws. So the context must be such that it is conducive to the energy acceptance. That's why the mother says receptivity. If you are not receptive, the energy can't do anything. Receptivity. Savitri does distance healing work on many people regularly. And uh, she said to me, she said, ah, I'm getting a call from somebody and I'm sending them light. They're sending it back to me. They're refusing it. I can't help them. It doesn't matter how powerful I am, I cannot help them if they do not receive. Receptivity. I'm going too much into that just now. Let's go back here. Okay, so now the last thing we're going to do in the last 10 minutes is mental centering. This thing will completely change your life. You have to to CEOs of multi-billion dollar companies and they use it regularly just to get their mind focused. Ready? Yes. Okay, sit up right as usual. <coughs> now, you have touched that bar a few minutes ago and you know that bar inside, right? Now we are going to do what the mother said. Enter into it. And there's a precise technique. Do not change this technique, do not modify it, do not try to make it into prana chi nonsense. This is just a simple technique to be done exactly this way as it was taught to Savitri and as she has taught it to me. You all agree? Yes. Don't yes. modify it. <laughs> Fingers together, hands slightly cupped. Place the hands next to your ears, palms facing each other, and fingertips pointing towards the ceiling. So fingertips pointing towards the ceiling, not back, but towards the ceiling. About six inches away from your head. Now I'll simplify the technique by giving it in four stages. The first is movement. So movement. Okay, that's the movement. Second is the breath. Inhale, Puraka. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Next is the intention. What is your intention? Your intention is to take the scattered mind, jitta vritti, the scattered, the oscillating mind, and bring it into that samatha, steady, still quietness, and then offer it to the heart. That's your intention. So now set your intention. I'm going to take this monkey mind. That is always distracting me from my path, from my dharma. And I center it and then offer it to the light in my heart. Exhale. Your 
dialogue. This is where Sri Aurobindo was masterful. He said, use the mind to still the mind. Instead of trying to say, no mind, you're coming in the way. I'm trying to go into the heart, you're coming in the way. No, use the mind to still the mind. The mind is the inappropriate tool to discover divinity, but it can be used to help you discover divinity. So you're going to speak to yourself. Example. Example. I gather my scattered thoughts and my senses. I bring and offer my thoughts and senses to the light within me. Now, at, when I teach this at big conferences, I can't say this, but I can say it here. In my mind, Mother and Sri Aurobindo are sitting in my heart. I offer everything to them. Always. But they being who they are, they really don't care whether you call them Mother Sri Aurobindo or you call them the Christ or whether you call them the light. They are divine. Yeah. So, use words that make sense to you, which have the effect of taking the mind and the senses. Pratyahara, controlling the senses. Inhale, and now give yourself the dialogue in your own mind. three times slowly by yourself. at a big conference, a very large room, hundreds of students. And as I was walking around, I saw one guy in the back, big burly guy. And I did not have time to, you know, take each person individually because it's such a large room, we have assistants and all that. And uh, so I saw him, a passant, and he had all these tattoos all over his body, you know, uh, skulls and all that sort of stuff. And so I said, nice, nice. And I continued walking around. And at the end of class, there was a line of people with questions. And he waited till the end. He sat in the back till the end. And then he walked up to me. I said, oh no, that man with the skulls is coming. <laughs> <laughs> and he came up all this to try to front up with this huge guy sitting on the stage. Huge guy. And he had his hands like this behind him and he said, I took your workshop two years ago in New York and you said something that completely changed my life. Mm. Oh, thank you. So I had it tattooed <sighs> on my arm. Mm -hmm. And he put his arms out, he pulled up his sleeve and he showed me and said, 
souls that do not aspire are God's failures. <laughs> From Sri Aurobindo's thoughts and glimpses. Souls that do not aspire are God's failures. Wow. So I look at it every day. Every day I look at it. And I remember I must aspire. Can you repeat what he said? Souls that do not aspire are God's failures. <laughs> of course, you're in the rights, and nature loves to promote them for it assures us of stability and prolongs our empire. Okay, so everyone, you've got things to do? Yes. Yeah? You've got the mental centering. You've got the hand touch to the heart center. You've got the three questions to ask yourself every single day. And you've got to find somebody who can help you. If you want to get a living presence of Sri Aurobindo and the mother, I suggest meeting Savitri. In our world today, I believe she's the one in direct contact with them. Uh, we've got stuff in the back which you can look at. We also have a teacher training which is now being taught in Pondicherry. Uh, the Purna Yoga teacher training. And uh, it, it is yoga in the vision of Sri Aurobindo, but with an emphasis on the body. I'll end with a quote from Herophilos, 300 BC. When health is absent, when health is absent, wisdom cannot reveal itself. Art cannot become manifest. Strength cannot be exerted. Wealth is useless and reason powerless. So let us resolve to get our bodies back and get our health back so that we can live Sri Aurobindo and the Mother's Yoga in day-to-day -day life. Namaste. Join me for one of Sri Aurobindo's gathering.